On May the 8th, bird watchers around the world took part in the Global Big Day. This 24-hour event encouraged birders to see as many species as possible within their local area. The Casual Birder podcast put forward a team across three continents to take part in this event. Members of our team had a range of birding experience, from novice to expert. Between us, we saw 430 species in Australia, Europe and North America. In this episode, I'll tell you about my experience of the big day, where I saw 54 species and visited two RSPB reserves. Plus, I did a spot of garden bird watching from the bedroom window in the morning. Welcome to the Casual Birder Podcast. I'm Susie Buttress. As a casual birder, I take time to watch birds as I go about my daily tasks. In my show, I'll tell you about the wild birds I've seen, speak with other enthusiasts, take bird walks, and share stories from listeners around the world. In case you missed it, last episode I spoke with Faraz Abdul. Faraz is a wildlife photographer and author of Casual Birding in Trinidad and Tobago. He told me how he became a casual birder and shared some of his favourite birding moments. Do take a listen. This episode is brought to you by Casual Birder Weekly, the show's newsletter. Each issue, I share exclusive updates and videos about the birds I've seen, tips to help you get the best birding experiences, recommendations for other podcasts or books I've enjoyed, and I let you know about any planned group birdwatch events. Sign up now. The link is in the episode notes. The Global Big Day is an initiative by Global Birding, Swarovski Optic, eBird and BirdLife International, which took place on the 8th of May 2021. Global Birding was created by past guest Tim Appleton, and you can hear about its inception in episode 78. The aim of the Global Big Day was to raise awareness of the challenges faced by migrating birds, while also encouraging people of all abilities to go out birding. By recording the bird scene and sharing the checklist with eBird, participants were then providing important data for future bird research. It was also quite exciting to see what other people were seeing on that same day. According to eBird's website, over 51,000 people from 192 countries, went out looking for birds that day. And over 7,000 species were recorded, which was absolutely amazing. There were four world records achieved that day. Global Big Day 2021 set a record for the greatest number of birders from the most countries reporting more species and more checklists on a single day of birding than ever before. The Casual Birder podcast team contributed to those numbers and I was delighted to hear this weekend that we placed seventh in the top international teams to have taken part that day. That is an awesome achievement. Thank you so much to the team. 20 people formed the team and it was made up of the following members. Jessica from Australia, Joe from France, Karin from Finland. From Scotland, there was Sean from Rum and Natasha from Shetland. From England, Hilary in Northumberland, Adam in Derbyshire, Andrew in West Yorkshire, Chris in South Yorkshire, me in Suffolk, Mike in Cambridgeshire, Mel in Essex and Kieran on the Isle of Wight. And from the United States, Stephanie in New Jersey, Laura May in Virginia, Angel and Elizabeth both in Texas, Paul and Karen both in California and Jeremy in Washington. We're a mix of novice and expert birders and it was wonderful to come together virtually and hear what everyone was seeing in their locations. And there'll be more on this later. May the 8th was also World Migratory Bird Day. Migration is a really challenging time for birds that are moving vast distances to their breeding grounds. They follow migration pathways which mean they face being trapped and killed by humans along these routes. We're raising funds to help BirdLife International tackle the illegal killing of these birds. The fundraiser is still open and we've currently reached just under halfway to our target. Thank you to all the people who've donated so far. 
and a special thanks to Viking Optical, who made a generous donation on behalf of our team, with the message, For Casual Birder podcast team, we love your international team and the mix of experts and beginners. Have a great day. If you are also able to help by donating or sharing our page, please go to justgiving.com forward slash fundraising forward slash casual birder. Thank you very much. The day before the Global Big Day was a beautiful sunny day. It was a little bit cold, a little bit windy, but with the sun out the air was warm and the birds were singing. What a shame then that in England on the 8th we were destined to have rain and wind. It was the last day of our vacation to Suffolk where we had been for the whole of the previous week and our vacation house had a fantastic garden about four times the length of the garden that I have at home and filled with mature trees and shrubs. Also it was in a fairly rural area which meant that there were lots of birds that we could hear and see that were different to my usual birds. So with all that in mind, I knew that on that final day of our holiday, I wanted to do as much bird watching as I could. Where we were staying had a great variety of birds, ones that I don't normally get a chance to see. So it was very fortunate for me that the global big day coincided with the time that I was in a new area, exploring and discovering new birds. As I had been doing all week, I got up really early in the morning. I think it was probably about 20 past five because the birds were already singing and I wanted to record as much as I could before leaving that area. So I got up, set my recorders running and then started my first bird watch of the day. Already the sun was starting to rise, but there was a big blanket of cloud covering most of the sky with a gap near the horizon. And I could see the sun coming up and filling the sky with red light as it underlit the clouds. And it made me think of the saying, red sky at night, shepherd's delight, red sky in the morning, shepherd's warning. As we already knew that we were going to have bad weather for the day, it wasn't a surprise to see the red sky in the morning. The rain wasn't due to start until about eight o'clock, so that gave me at least three hours to pack up all the rest of our belongings ready for leaving, but also to get some bird watching in. So my first bird watch took place at 5.35, and that was for one hour. I was only going to watch for half an hour, but uh, there was just so much going on, I had to continue watching. The first bird that I saw was a ring-necked pheasant, which is a very unusual bird for, well, I would never get one in my garden at home. It'd be highly unlikely. But in a rural location, pheasants often do walk into people's gardens. I think it was the same one that had been there the previous day and it had discovered the seed that I'd put down. So, um, of course, it came back for that. A couple of unusual birds that we had. I had seen a small falcon or hawk flying through the garden several times during the holiday. I had determined that it was a hobby It was a very small, dark bird with drawn back wings. reminded me of a large swift, but it was most definitely a bird of prey. We did have a pair of kestrels that had been seen over the house and gardens a couple of times during the week, and it was smaller than that. And certainly it wasn't a kestrel. I recognise a kestrel's colouring. So a hobby has red thigh feathers, but unfortunately from the angle that I saw it, I could only see the dark back. But having checked in my guides... The hobby is the bird that it's likely to be. Other birds that came to the garden were the regulars that I would see at home, like magpie, wood pigeon, uh, blue tit, great tit, robin, blackbird, dunnock, goldfinch. There were chaffinches, the black cap. We also could hear a skylark. I did see it on one of the earlier days in the week, but on that day I couldn't see it against the sky. It was just too difficult to spot, but I could definitely hear it. Oh yes, and we had collared dove in the garden as well. So I got uh, 18 species in that first hour. And then just as I was packing everything up, getting ready to do breakfast and and leave the property, 
I could suddenly hear a cuckoo calling and I wanted to have that as part of my checklist because it had been a feature of the week, being able to stand in the garden and hear a cuckoo calling. Again, something that I would be highly unlikely to hear at home, but in this rural garden, it was really wonderful to hear. And then while I was listening to the cuckoo, a turtle dove started calling. I've never seen a turtle dove, but I know their distinctive call. And so I was able to identify this quite early on in the week. And I did spend several days during the week wandering around trying to find where the turtle doves were calling from because I would love to have seen one. So my second checklist was just for 15 minutes and just to sort of mop up birds that had started to call out since I finished my first checklist. And I had quite a few exciting birds in that one because I had the the cuckoo, the turtle dove, a herring gull uh, turned up in the garden and I heard a green woodpecker and also a great spotted woodpecker. I think I may just have seen the great spotted woodpecker but it was behind some trees and possibly on the trunk but I definitely heard it and recognised it. I had seen the great spotted woodpecker earlier in the week in the garden so once again this, this garden had so many birds that I would love to see on a regular basis. And the wren came out to play as well. And I got a nice little video of the wren uh, hopping through one of the shrubs in the garden. We were due to leave the accommodation at nine o'clock and on cue at eight o'clock, the rain started. So we, we, finished our breakfast, packed the rest of the stuff away in the car and headed on down to North Warren, which is an RSPB reserve, which was within walking distance of the property. And that's where we'd heard many times during the week a bittern booming. So I was really keen to be able to have a chance to see the bittern, but definitely to to hear it and record it for the big day. So we arrived at the reserve But by that time, it was really heavy rain. We wrapped up with our over trousers and waterproof jackets and headed out on a 15 minute walk to get to a viewing platform that we'd found earlier in the week where we could hear the bittern booming from. And uh, it was a pretty miserable walk. It was possible to see and hear birds as we were walking along, even though it was really raining and quite high winds. But uh, one of the nice things was that I managed to get some really nice views of a skylark, of two skylarks, in fact. So a couple of days before, we had been at a different RSPB reserve, Snape Warren, and they had woodlarks there. Now, this was a lifer for me. I'd never seen woodlarks before. In fact, until this holiday, I don't think I knew that woodlarks existed. But we had watched a BTO video on YouTube the night before uh, the big day to find out how to identify woodlark and skylark and what the differences were and that proved to be really helpful because not only did I positively identify the woodlark that I had seen previously but it gave me a few more reminders about what a skylark looks like about the size of it being a larger bird more like size of a starling and the fact that they have these white outer tail feathers which I've never seen when they've been flying up in the air calling because they're always too far away. But these two were being, I'm not sure if they were being chased by crows or whether they were chasing the crows, but they were flying around quite low to the ground. And because of that, I got some really good views of the white tail feathers and could see how sort of long and sleek the birds were themselves. So that was a fortuitous coming together of having watched the video the night before and then seeing the birds on the big day. So on the way to the viewing platform, we crossed a small river, which the rest of the week had been looking quite stagnant. But because the rain was falling heavily on it, it had broken up the surface and and made it look quite pleasant. And there was a mallard on that river. And as I looked down the river, I realised there was a grey heron not very far down it, hunting along the edge of the bank. So that was another couple of species that we could add to our days list. We got to the viewing platform and stood there for probably about five minutes because it was very, very unpleasant. But in that time, luckily, the bittern boomed. Now, it only boomed once, but it was so familiar to us by that time that uh, we both heard it and knew that that's what we'd heard. It would have been nice to have thought that maybe on that day, the bittern would come out to have a look around because it was quiet, 
apart from the noise of the rain, but uh, it wasn't to be. Oh, while we were at the viewing platform, not only did we hear the bittern, but we saw a marsh harrier flying around quite low over the reeds, and it was upsetting a flock of grey lag geese. You could hear the voices calling. They got very agitated, and then they suddenly took off. So uh, we were able to see the geese as well, which we wouldn't have known were there if the marsh harrier hadn't been flying over and disturbing them. We also heard a sedge warbler and a reed warbler. Until this week, I wasn't really sure how to tell them apart. But once again, we'd watched a video on YouTube about the sedge and reed warbler. We'd also been listening during the week to the sound files that came with the book uh, The RSPB Guide to Birdsong by Adrian Thomas. And that also described the songs of the sedge warbler and the reed warbler. And so we were trying very hard to listen for the beats within the song as they called out. And we're sure we heard two different birds. On the way back to the car, uh, we were walking quite briskly, but we still managed to see a jay. So on that little walk, although it was wet and horrible, I managed to get 20 species. So that was really good. Some of those were the same as the ones I'd seen in the garden. The great tip, blue tip were, were garden birds, along with the wren and blackbird and robin and chaffinch that I saw. It was still good to have got out and done the walk, even though we were so wet. Luckily, I had some spare towels in the car, so we were able to put those in the car seat when we got back in because we were drenched. We decided that we would still go to RSPB Minsmere for a couple of hours of bird watching, even though the weather was so awful, because the water birds wouldn't have cared. And we also knew that there was a cafe there, so it'd be nice to get a hot drink. But on the way, we went past Thorpe Ness, a small seaside town, which has a large sort of boating lake, I think it is. So as we were driving to Thorpe Ness, we stopped at a very small lay-by near the sea. Well, we couldn't see the sea from the lay-by, but we could look inland to these marshy fields where I'd spotted a swan. So we just stopped there for 10 minutes. It was raining so hard, we had to have the windscreen wipers on. And I was trying to peer through the, the rain-covered windows with my binoculars. Um, but I was able to see eight grey leg geese, the mute swan, there were 10 wood pigeon, two swift flew past in the rain. I felt so sorry for them. Uh, 30 herring gull and a jackdaw. So six species there, uh, just in 10 minutes of really driving rain and wind. So you wouldn't have thought you'd see any birds at all. So that was quite surprising. Then we drove on to Thorpe Ness and at Thorpe Ness Mere, I was able to see 11 species. We were only there for 10 minutes because once again, the weather was so awful. And also by that time, I was quite hoping to use some facilities. So I wanted to get up to Minsmere. The very first bed we saw when we parked was a couple of mallards really close to the car, dabbling away in a puddle. And I just thought, yes, in this weather, that's perfect. They don't mind it at all. In the mere itself, there were lots and lots of swallows and house martins constantly wheeling around and swooping down and, and gathering up um, the insects as they flew. We heard a Chetty's warbler there, which I was very surprised at because it just didn't feel like the sort of habitat where a little Chetty's warbler would turn up. But um, there were some reeds around, but it just felt a little bit too close to town. So there I also saw mute swan again and Canada geese. I opened my side window while I was sitting there because the rain was on the other side of the car and I was able to hear a green finch and a chaffinch calling out. Um, I'm very familiar with both of their songs so it was easy to add those to my list. From there we drove up to RSPB Minsmere. If you want to feed your garden birds and you're not sure what feeder to buy, take a look at my new bird feeder report. It tells you about the different types of bird feeders what food to put in them, and what birds will eat from them. Get the report now at bit.ly forward slash bird feeder report or check the show notes for the link. We had visited RSPB Minsmere early in the week of our stay in Suffolk and it was a very stormy day. We were very unlucky with the weather that week. So we'd had a, a bit of a walk around, but we hadn't really explored fully. Saturday the 8th didn't look like it was going to be any better so because the rain was still quite heavy and it was windy we thought we would just go to Minsmere 
stop off, have a coffee, maybe a cake, and just see what birds we could see. We took a very slow walk from the cafe through part of a little uh, area that was bordered by shrubs and scrub and then out onto a more sort of marshy, reedy area towards the sea. But it was so exposed there that we didn't go too far. But on that walk, we had a lovely view of a green woodpecker pecking, looking for insects in little mounds of earth in the field. And I was able to get a reasonable video, a bit shaky because I didn't have a tripod and it was quite windy. But it was lovely to have such nice views and really see the the green of the plumage and the black face markings, which we don't always see because normally we only hear green woodpeckers and then just see the sort of torpedo shape as it flies past. So to be able to see it on the ground looking for insects was quite a, a nice moment. There were also quite a lot of uh, black-headed gull flying around. Didn't see any sand martins. They did have some sand martins starting to use the burrows there, but uh, we didn't see any, although we did see some swallows. Earlier in the week, I saw a swift, and it was my first swift of the year. And when I mentioned it to one of the wardens, he said that no one had recorded a swift there yet this year. My sighting was the first, so that was good. So on this uh, on the Saturday, we had a good look in the field where they've got some stone curlews nesting. But these are really hard to spot, these birds, and the, the field has got undulations in it. So unless the, the stone curlews were moving around, there was not really any chance of seeing them. Um, some of the usual birds that we would see as we walked past the feeders that they have there, there were plenty of chaffinches, blue tits, great tits, robin and uh, a sorry dunnock. And then as we'd walked past the woodpecker field towards the marshes, we heard Chetty's Warbler again. Uh, There's a a good description of the Chetty's Warbler in my episode with Lev Perikian, uh, where he describes it and then we hear it. So if you do want to hear what a a Chetty's Warbler sounds like, take a listen to, to my episode with Lev. The call is very explosive. It's loud and it just shouts at you from the reeds um now that i know i mean i I don't think i ever really knew what it sounded like until i spoke with lev and we we had that walk in the london wetland center that was where i really learned what a chetty warbler sounded like and now i find them extremely easy to pick out whenever we're in the right habitat so from the marshes we wandered back and there's a platform that you can look out over the sort of the seabird area On a better day, it would have been nice to walk down there, but it was just so horrible. We stayed up on the platform and I got some videos and counted what I could of the birds that I could see. There was a lapwing. I spotted a couple of avocets, which I have now become familiar with how they look when they're flying because we'd seen some earlier in the week, Uh, mostly white with uh, black lines near their body and black tips to the wings. I saw a, a cormorant fly through the gulls. Lots and lots of black-headed gulls sitting on the ground, but also flying around. Again, lots of swallows. Walking back past the platform, I managed to see a white throat, which I was really pleased at because I hadn't had brilliant views during the week. I think I'd had one other view. I'm still not absolutely sure what they sound like, so I don't know that I would be able to pick one out without seeing it, but uh, I was really pleased to see this one. Oh, a couple of additional birds, which I, well, I saw them when I was there, but didn't record them for whatever reason. So I had a video of looking out over the the seabird area. And when I reviewed that over the weekend, there were a couple of barnacle geese and there was a gadwall uh, sitting near the barnacle geese, but they weren't on my list. So I had to add those afterwards. But in reviewing that video, I spotted two other species that I hadn't been able to see when I was standing there, but I could see in the video and could identify. One of those was a ringed plover, and the other one was mallards that I could see in the video, but I hadn't spotted uh, when I was looking. So I've added them to my list. Understanding the ethics of whether I should add something that I saw, like the barnacle geese, but didn't record, or something that like the ringed plover, which I saw when I reviewed the video, but didn't actually see when I was there. So is it ethical to add it to my list? I don't know. I've added it. You tell me if you think that that was an ethical thing to do. But for that checklist, I saw 24 species. We then uh, went back and had lunch at the cafe area. Walking back for lunch, we heard a cuckoo calling out from the woods there. And we stood for a little while and watched the birds on the feeders. And I was able to see a nuthatch and a great spotted woodpecker while there. 
Oh, and I got coltit as well. Uh, got 15 species just while we were standing around the feeders. Not all of them were on the feeder. Some of them were ones we heard. So we heard a green woodpecker again, saw a magpie. We had at the feeders, we had cold tit, blue tit, great tit. I heard a long tail tit and saw that up in the tree, but it didn't come to the feeders. And then hopping around the base of the feeders was a wren and robin, chaffinch, and there were two goldfinches up in the tree. And walking around the base of all of the feeders was this pheasant as well. So there's another one we'd seen during the day. After lunch, we took one more walk around, uh, went into the woodlandy bits near the visitor centre. And uh, the only additional birds that I picked up there were a uh, chiffchaff and a reed warbler. But we'd already had those birds during the day. Certainly we'd had the reed warbler from North Warren. So um, didn't really add anything else. But what we did do was get a nice view of a, a muntjac deer while we were walking down there. So that was nice. We found out that the hides were due to be opened in two weeks time, which is a real shame that our trip didn't coincide with that. But, you know, we're all finding that at the moment. We're getting out when we can and it doesn't always coincide with the best time for things. But uh, it was really great being at Minsmere. Oh, and one other thing I meant to mention was while I was watching the green woodpecker, we got talking to Keith, one of the wardens that was walking around the site. And um, I talked to him about the nightingales in the area. So I said to him that I thought that I had been hearing a nightingale from my accommodation but I couldn't be absolutely sure. And I did get some recordings, but they're very, very faint. So I'd have to really boost them. But he shared with me a recording that he'd taken and it had very, very similar sound. So the bird that I'd been hearing had a kind of seep, 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 chup, 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 that kept being repeated. And that phrasing was exactly what was in his nightingale recording. So I'm even more sure that what I heard was a nightingale. So that was another lifer for that holiday. By that time, the the rain had stopped, fortunately, and the wind was dropping as well. But we had a three hour drive home back to Hampshire, so we couldn't really hang around any longer. But we were at Minsmere for four hours, which really surprised me because I wasn't expecting that at all. I thought we'd pop in for an hour, have a coffee and cake and then head on home. But once we were out, we were just seeing so much. It was it was really wonderful. At that point in the day, eBird was telling me that I had seen 49 species and we were hoping that I would see one other just to make it around 50 species. But what my husband suggested we do was stop at one of the services on the way home. And in the words of comic Bill Bailey, services are the best places to see pied wagtails. And it's true. Very often you'll stop at a a service station and there'll be a pied wagtail or a white wagtail, they're sometimes called. So we we stopped at services and we saw five species and blow me down, one of them was a pied wagtail. So that took me up to 50 species. Of course, having reviewed the video of the seabirds at Minsmere, that's actually taken me higher and I've got 54 species now. But it was still wonderful on the day to have felt that I sought out a bird and, and, and got it. So in reviewing the the big day, it was a really interesting event for me. The only other time that I've ever tried doing a big day and choosing a variety of habitats is last October for the Global Bird Weekend. And it so happened that that also coincided with the last day of a holiday that we'd had. That one was on the Isle of Wight. We had a few hours to kill before our ferry back to the mainland. So I chose a few different sites to visit to try to get as many species as possible. And on that day, I got 46 species. But I have to say, this big day in May, if it had been the previous day when the sun was out, my feeling is we would have seen a lot more species. So partly that's because I think there would be more birds around, but also because we would have been more willing to stand out in the open and maybe go for longer walks. But I was really pleased with my my 54 species in one day. That's one of my biggest days of birding. I really hope to get out more during this early part of summer because I'm, I feel like I'm starting to learn more about the, the warblers that I'm not very familiar with. And it would be great to add some of those to my, my repertoire. Being a casual birder, I don't try very hard. And I'm sure if I was a more directed kind of birder, I would have got a much, much bigger list that day even with the weather, because there were still things 
out. You know, the marsh harrier was still flying around. The bittern was still calling. Um, the skylarks were there. The swallows and swifts were flying around. There were birds coming to bird tables at the RSPB site. So there were there were plenty of easy gets. And then I'm sure that there were some more birds around that um, I just didn't spot that a more experienced birder would have seen or heard. But it's really, it is really interesting to have the opportunity to see lots of species in one day and still have the time to stop and watch them. So we were able to stop and just watch this green woodpecker as it hopped around a field. And, you know, I had no pressure on me to think I've really got to hurry up and see the next species. And that kind of birding wouldn't suit me at all. But then others in my team had really, really directed birding. And um, I'll tell you some of their stories next. Here's some of the experiences from the Casual Birder podcast team from the Global Big Day. Christopher from South Yorkshire said that because the weather had been so bad, he did most of his bird watch for the day from his window. But he did take a short walk when the rain stopped during the evening. He saw 21 species, plus five heard but not seen. And he was pleased to see blue tits which nest in a neighbour's garden and his favourite grey wagtail. And he said the last birds to go on the list were the most colourful two mandarin ducks. Karin in Finland saw 11 white-tailed eagles emerging from the frosty fields. She said they all sat around like sentries fed up with a chilly watch duty. She also saw some display marsh harriers. Adam from Derbyshire said he did enjoy taking part in the global big day but it's a shame that the weather was not so great. Andrew from West Yorkshire had some great experiences during the day. Top of the list for him he said had to be the most incredibly confiding dipper that he'd ever seen. He'd set a personal deadline of 7pm at Ilkley Old Bridge and at one minute to the hour, after a quarter of an hour of watching, up it pops and it spent the next quarter of an hour feeding, cleaning and preening only a few metres away from him on the riverbank. He said it was gorgeous and he just couldn't leave. And during the worst of the downpour early in the morning, he spotted a male gargany sheltering at the back of the pond he was watching. It was only his second ever sighting. He said overall he had a fab time and it was a very interesting challenge. But he also said he's learned a lot about efficient bird watching. He lost a lot of momentum in the middle of the day and had to take a warming up and drying off break. Well, that's fair enough. It was a very, very wet day. Kieran on the Isle of Wight said that he got 34 species in total and the highlights included five swift coming in off the sea, two fulmar displaying and an obliging jay. And Stephanie from New Jersey was at Sandy Hook. Among her sightings of note was a king eider and a golden crowned sparrow, which is a West Coast bird, so it was a real rarity for them. Jeremy in Washington State said, I think the most fun and unexpected bird for me that day was a dunlin in almost full breeding plumage mixed in with a collection of other smaller sandpipers. Their breeding plumage is a gorgeous reddish brown on the back with a light chest but a very, very dark black belly that stands out. They should be further north of us by now, so it was fun and unexpected to see one straggler mixed in with other sandpipers at a small suburban marshland park that I frequent. It was also the first time I'd seen a Dunlin within five miles of my house, which is what I focused my big day efforts on. Paul in California is a really expert birder, and he was spending the big day doing a real big day. He had 24 hours visiting a variety of habitats, and recording the birds he saw. He got 170 birds on his species list for the global big day, which is amazing. One of the birds that he saw that day was a first state record for May of a rusty blackbird. He said the best bird of the day was a displaying Costa's hummingbird, which is a rare visitor to their region. The run also produced their first ever prairie falcon for a big day. The group of people that Paul was with had a very targeted big day, and had even done a dry run the day before to check that they could get to all the habitats. Karen, in California, went with her Audubon group on a big day and saw 111 species. They walked 7.8 miles, drove around 250 miles and were in temperatures from just above freezing to close to 32 degrees, everyone in shorts, and was out for 14 and a half hours. She said, To say I'm invigorated would not be far from the truth. The wind was howling at about 80 kilometres for hours with no break and a wildfire broke out but was quickly contained. 
She said it was a great day and they only stopped because they ran out of daylight. The next big day will be Global Bird Weekend in October 2021 and I really hope you'll consider being part of our team. In the meantime, we'll have some more fun group birdwatching events, so keep a lookout for those. Personal recommendation is a powerful way to help others find the show. If you enjoy what you hear, please tell a friend or give the show a shout out on social media. You can also help support the show's production by contributing to its tip jar. The easiest way to do this is to buy me a virtual coffee. Your donations help fund my production costs and are very much appreciated. Do keep in touch. Tell me about your favourite sightings by leaving me a voice or email message on my website, casualbirder.com. And don't forget to sign up for the newsletter, Casual Birder Weekly. The links to all of these are in the episode notes. Last call this week is a recording that I made on the morning of the Global Big Day. You can listen to this recording of Just Bird Calls and Songs at the end of the episode. Thank you to Randy Braun for designing the artwork for the show. The theme music is Short Sleeve Shirt by The Drones. Thanks to them for letting me use it. Check out their website at dronesmusic.net. Thank you all for listening. And I hope you'll join me again for another episode of the Casual Birder podcast. Last call. Last call this week is a recording I made on the morning of the Global Big Day. It was made at 6.55 in the morning in the garden of our rental accommodation in Suffolk. The main birds are Great Tit, Common Wood Pigeon, Dunnock and Chaffinch. And you can also hear carrion crow, pheasant, turtle dove, blue tit and collared dove.